Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again today to As I Live in Grief. Guess what? One of my favorite people is back. And you love him, too, because I see the numbers. John Polo is back today, and we have a brand new topic to discuss. This is one that you hear me say every time I go to sign off the podcast. We're going to talk about self-care. We're going to talk about what it is, why it's important, and maybe even, who knows, give you some ideas on what you might do to take better care of yourself while you're grieving, because self-care can, in fact, alleviate some of the symptoms of grief. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Hey, John, welcome back. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. You know, I always love to do this with you. Oh, and I just I just love to spend time with you as well. So others may not have listened to one of the other episodes where you have been our guest. So very quickly, would you just give our listeners a little bit of your background? Yeah, so my story really starts when I was 17 years old. I met and fell in love with Michelle. We dated for a year in high school before she broke my heart. Eight years later, she emailed me out of the blue. Long story short, we ended up starting our life together. Two and a half years after that, she got sick with cancer. And two and a half years after that, she died. I was 31 when she died. She was 30. I was shattered beyond belief. Again, a very long story, very short. About a month after she passed away, my friend suggested I start a blog. Michelle would obviously be a lot, spend a lot of time, you know, in the hospital sleeping. I would have a lot of time with nothing to do. I would be posting on Facebook page, kind of just releasing my thoughts and emotions. And a friend noticed that that was probably helpful to me in some way. So again, after she passed, that same friend suggested that I start a blog. I did, with absolutely no intention of it being anything it is today, simply as a way to process my raw grief. But what it has become is four books and a full-time coaching and public speaking career. It's super. And you are so engaging that I'm, if it were in my abilities, I would probably wind up in the audience as one of your biggest fans everywhere you went. At any rate, we have this podcast to kind of help with that. You said something in your little background that first I want to clarify for our listeners. You mentioned raw grief. Can you define raw grief? I think obviously it's different for everybody, but there are also a lot of universal truths to grief. And for me, it was, you know, on the floor sobbing so hard that my insides physically ached and I was convinced I would never, ever, ever be able to get up off that floor or stop sobbing. I know a lot of my most intense grief was while she was still alive, knowing that I was going to lose her. I suffered very bad from anticipatory grief, but obviously... Right. Suffer very bad from grief after she passed too. But yeah, it's just those moments where you are convinced that you cannot go on. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and, and it is different for everyone. I wasn't on the floor sobbing, but I did spend some time on the couch sobbing. Yeah. So, you know, little things can be different. And you mentioned anticipatory grief. And I think that's pretty easy to understand. It's knowing that someone is going to die at some point. And you kind of go through all those thoughts already in your head. What's going to happen to me? What's it going to be like? What do I have to do now? Uh, and and the fact, too, that you're powerless yeah. to do anything about it. Did the fact that you had that period of anticipatory grief make a difference in your raw grief, do you think? I think it probably did a little bit. There's a, there's a little thing I wrote that I haven't posted yet on social media, but I'm going to. But it says something along the lines of, Knowing that she was going to die prepared me for her death. It did not prepare me to do this life without her. Mm. So do I think that, I think any way you lose somebody that you love is 
horrible. Like they're so different, but they're all so uniquely horrible. Do I think that knowing she was gonna die like prepared me for her death? Of course. But those two and a half years of watching her die were unbelievably traumatic and horrible. Right. And it didn't prepare me on what do I do now? It didn't prepare me for that first moment when I went home right. and she wasn't there and my kid wasn't there. And I just laid in the bed with, you know, an old photograph of her. Like it didn't prepare me for that. Right. I think it prepares you for the fact that it's going to happen, but it doesn't prepare you for how you're going to feel once it does. Right. Or the reality yeah. of that grief, I don't think it prepares you for. I felt the same with my husband. I only had eight months. Two and a half years is a long time for anticipatory grief. I had eight months, but still in that eight months, I knew it was going to happen. I knew when I walked into the facility that morning and saw him that it was likely going to happen that very day. It still did not prepare me for the moment he took his last breath. That was the reality and Eight months did not prepare me for that moment yeah. or how I felt afterward. Yeah. 100%. So we talk about self-care all the time. Self-care sounds easy. Take care of yourself. But what does it really mean and why does it help? So I'm going to share a story with you to answer that question. Okay. I remember it was about eight months after Michelle passed and my life in Every single way was a dumpster fire. I mean, every single way in my life fell apart beyond belief. And it was about eight months after she passed, and the holidays were approaching. And I remember just being on the floor in the master bedroom that was once ours and was now only mine, and just being on the floor sobbing. And in that moment, it hit me that I had been a caretaker my entire life. From the age of 12 to 27 with my mom, for a year, when I was 23 to 24, when my dad had cancer before he died, and then for Michelle. And it hit me in that moment that I had to begin to take care of myself. And it wasn't because I felt worthy of it in that moment. It was an epiphany that I had out of necessity. Like, I have to do this if I'm going to survive this and have a chance to rebuild. But going to your question, I didn't know what that meant in the moment. I had no idea how to start taking care of myself. I didn't know who I was. I didn't even know, you know, what would help me in a given moment, let alone this self-care stuff. And I think that kind of goes to how society talks about self-care. To me, self-care is resting. It is, you know, working out or chocolate cake or bubble baths. But when you're Especially when you're trying to like survive a horrible loss and rebuild, we have to take self care beyond those basics. What do you mean? Well, one of the things I mean is people are a version of self care. People are a version of self care. I started paying very close attention to who I was around when I felt better and who I was around when I felt worse. Who lifted me up and who tore me down? Who made me laugh? And who made me, you know, frown? Who, who was I around when I felt a moment of hope? And who was I around when I maybe felt more hopeless? People are a version of self-care. And that is always true, but that is even more true if you're going through something horrible like losing someone you love with all your heart. Right. The simplest things really can be a form of self-care that you don't realize. And for all the conversations I've had with people about self-care, John, no one has ever said people, the people you surround yourself with or the people you associate with, the people you spend a moment on the phone or a moment in chat or a moment passing by in the grocery store can make all the difference in the world. I've never heard anyone say that people can be a form of self-care. I love that. I love that. Did you find that being with certain people alleviated the symptom of grief, even if for a brief time? You know, I always go back to 18 months out. After Michelle passed, 18 months out, I went to speak at my first conference. Okay. And it was Camp Widow, a grief conference. 
And that was the first time that I felt like I had community. Like I mean that there wasn't something wrong with me. Like I felt normal. It was the first time that I laughed again, like a genuine laugh. Outside of the laugh with my daughter, like with, with anyone other than her, it was the first time I laughed again. And I noticed parts of the old me kind of coming back and, and mm-hmm. parts of the new me developing. So yeah, I think when you're around the right people and you feel those things, you feel a moment of laughter, you feel a moment of hope, you see your smile coming back, you feel seen or heard or validated, that's gonna that's gonna take some of the burden off of your shoulder. That's going to take some of the despair away from your soul, right? And if you surround yourself with people who make you feel the opposite, unseen, unheard, judging your grief, it's gonna add burden right. to your shoulders and add despair to you. Right. Right. And, and people's probably one of the things, again, you don't realize it. But it's easy for people to talk about, oh, so-and-so said this to me, or so-and-so did this, and they didn't feel acknowledged or respected. And those are the things you need to really pay attention to, I think. You, you mentioned sobbing on the floor and not um, being able to get up or being able to do anything like that. Was there also a component of not wanting to? That's a great question. So I did a video on this a few months ago. I think there was definitely a time where I was scared to smile. I was scared to find my lack of that. I was scared to have any kind of enjoyment in my life because I did feel like doing those things would mean I was letting Michelle go in some way or she was drifting away. And where I'm at now, and I'm not entirely sure when this happened, and it probably was around the two year mark, where, around the 18 month mark, where I realized that that was not true. That her love and her memory walked with me every single day. And actually, where I'm at now, how that's developed throughout the years, is I actually feel closer to her when I'm smiling, when I'm happy, when I'm feeling peaceful and hopeful. Because during those moments when I'm during those right. moments when I'm having a really bad day, or, you know, the rebuilding process seems like it took 27 steps back, right. anger comes up. And it's that anger, why did you leave me? I think her when she didn't want to leave. And guess yeah. what? Like, at this point, anger doesn't make me feel close enough. Mm-hmm. So, the better place I get in, the closer I feel to her at this point. Yeah. That's, that's great. And it's, sometimes I think it takes a lot of introspection to to even realize that it is that way. Or sometimes you may just have a fleeting thought and then catch yourself and say, whoa, wait a minute. And all of a sudden realize that you did feel that way, that that you felt closer, in fact. I've had similar uh, reactions. I was recently vacationing with my family in Jamaica and I had introduced Tom to travel. He never liked to travel, he was a homebody. But I got him interested in going to new places and learning new cultures and just interacting with people that you never in the world would have met had you not traveled. And we were in Jamaica and we were at a little store and there was hot sauce. Well, hot sauce was always Tom's thing. Any bottle of hot sauce he had never seen before, he would have to buy. He had a collection of hot sauce. And we were in a market and I saw some hot sauce and I thought, oh gosh, I wanted to buy it. And I just, in that moment, I just felt much, much closer to Tom. I'm coming up on five years without him. And there are moments indeed that I feel closer to him. And in feeling closer to him now, I don't have that overwhelming grief that I used to have. I can smile about it now and I can remember and I can think to myself, the fact that I thought about this means that he's really here with me. He's still with me in my heart. And I recognize this, I associate him with it, and that brings him closer to me. So in that moment, when you're sobbing on the floor and you're unable to do anything or sobbing on the couch or wherever you are, maybe you've stayed inside for two weeks, not gone outside at all. And in today's world, it's really easy even to get groceries for yourself without ever leaving your home. How do you, or at what point, 
can you turn things around and make a decision that this can't go on, that you need to do something about it? Right. That's a great question. So I'll say a couple of things. First off, I think a different version of self-care is grieving the way that you need to grieve, regardless of the, what anyone says, right? Like okay. grieving the way you need to grieve and calling yourself to do that. And what happens is if you do that, if you empower yourself to grieve the way you need to grieve, once you're ready to start rebuilding and to live again, now you set the stage where it's easier to do that. So again, that's kind of an alternative version of self-care. I think that we all have the ability to make ourselves a priority in our own life. And notice how I use the word a. I don't mm-hmm. stand up, whether it's on a podcast or at a conference, and say everybody in this audience should make themselves the priority in their own life. I'm not going to say that. I don't okay. know who's sitting in the back of the room whose husband died and has three small kids, and she can't maybe make herself the priority. Great I, point. I firmly believe we can all make ourselves a priority in our own life. And that has to kind of be the first step. Like, I matter. My survival matters. Me giving myself a chance to rebuild in a real way matters. And I have to zone in on myself. And one of the things I started to do, because I told you about that moment eight months out, I didn't know what to do with that for like a year. Mm-hmm. I kind of sat there on the show. Like, I didn't know what to do with that. But about 18 months, 20 months in it, it knew what to do with that. And I started treating myself the same way I would treat my late wife, Michelle. I started zoning in on myself the same way I would zone in on her. What would I do when she was sick? When was her medicine due? Did I have to follow up with a doctor? Was she hungry? Oh, was she nauseous? Do I need to go in the other room and eat so she did not have to smell my pizza? I would zone in on her, right? And I began to do that for myself. Who was I around when I felt better? Who was I around when I felt worse? What was I doing when I felt better? What was I doing when I felt worse? Where was I at when I felt better? Where was I at when I felt worse? I started zoning in on every little thing that gave me even just a moment of feeling happy or peaceful or healthy, or resting, or productive, or hopeful. Every little thing. I took note of it in my head. I wrote it down. This made me feel better for 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. That's where I started. Hmm. That's great. And again, you've made an incredible point, and I want to reemphasize it. The A priority as opposed to the priority. So let's think a minute for those people that have other people at home they need to care for. And probably the primary instance is when you're a parent and you have children at home that are also grieving. And since everyone grieves differently, your children are grieving differently than you are. And each of your children is grieving differently than the other child in your life. Many people will stuff their own grief to the back. They'll stuff it so that they can continue to be the parent for those children. Is there a way that they can practice some self-care to prevent that stuffing and still kind of be that person, that parent that they feel they need to be for their kids? Yeah, I mean, I'll answer that in a different way. So obviously, everyone has to parent their children the way that they see best fit. But this is like a general rule Again, it's not going to apply to every single person, but as a general rule, I think it's a good thing when we, at least sometimes, show our children our grief. I'm not saying you have to show it to them every single day. But right. when you cry in front of your child, when you show your pain in front of your child, you're giving them the unspoken okay to cry, to show pain. And then there's one more thing you do. You're, you're doing it. When you get back up, they see you. Get right. back up. And that right. is inspirational for them, not only now, but as they move forward with life, right? I saw my mom mm-hmm. shattered after my dad died, right? I saw, you know, my dad being shattered after my mom died. And I remember that, right? Getting back up. Like, this is what mm-hmm. your child will think 20 years from now if something happens to them. So I think it can be inspirational in that sense. I also think going to your question, you know, if you can 
surround yourself with people who you can talk to, whether it's, you know, if you're a little person, making other little connections. So maybe it's, you know, 8 p.m. every night now, and you get to talk to your widow friend, and you guys just get to kind of cry together. And mm-hmm. you just don't need to see that part, right? But maybe you're in your own room doing that, or a therapist, or a coach. So I think that the more we work on ourselves, the better parents we will ultimately be. Like, you can be a good parent even when you're shattered. You could be a good parent being profoundly unhappy. But I do think when we are in a better place mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, we do our best parenting. And that's another reason that we should all be looking in the mirror and saying, how can I make myself a priority in my own life? Okay. Yeah, I, I like that. I A lot of times we'll use the analogy of being on, the, on an airplane and when the flight attendants go through that safety thing, and they talk about if the oxygen masks drop from the ceiling, you should put yours on first. Because you can't really help someone else unless you help yourself first. It sounds like a similar principle if you're a parent and you have children grieving. Though you may want to completely stuff everything you're feeling. Number one, that's not good for you. And there's certainly an element of education and awareness you can offer your children. By grieving, by crying, by being sad, some of those things, yet finding ways Maybe that you can practice something that is self-caring for yourself and also helps your kids. And surrounding people sounds like a somewhat easy way to do that because we all do have people in our lives. We do have networks, whether it's family or friends, or maybe you find other families or uh, groups in a community like a bereavement support group or something. So there are ways that you can surround yourself with other people. Even if you take your kids to the park and let them play on the playground, that offers them some time to just be themselves and kind of be free and be natural. And at the same time, it puts you in an atmosphere where you can watch them. And I don't know too many parents that don't enjoy watching their kids have fun. I really don't. So even that, for the briefest of moments, even a trip to the park, a trip to the zoo, you know, anything like that can be self-caring. And the other thing I want to say is, I think that there's healing power in shared pain. And again, as I'm talking about self-care, and I think outside the box with self-care, that's a different version of self-care. So let me give you a quick example. Let's say there's a 42-year-old mom somewhere that just lost her husband. And she has a 12-year-old son. That mom does not ever, ever, ever want to show grief in front of that son. So every night that mom goes in her bedroom and sobs by herself. Mm-hmm. And every night that 12-year-old boy goes in his bedroom and sobs by himself. Mm-hmm. Those two coming together and sobbing together and holding each other and telling a funny story about dad or, or sharing a sad memory or their desperation and their despair together that can be healing. And that can be an alternative version of self-care as well. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to be it every single night with your kid, but there is healing power in shared pain. Yeah, that gave me goosebumps. It sounds like a very powerful moment, too, that parent and child might have together. A very powerful moment. And bring those two closer together, even, yeah. in, in their combined sadness and grief. I want to speak briefly, and our time is flying by, but I want to speak briefly about, we've talked uh, about parent. We haven't really separated male versus female. It's a known fact that men grieve differently than women, because after all, we all have different characteristics. So I want to talk for a moment, what might self-care look like for a man? Will it be different than what it might be for a woman? Um, I've never been asked that question, so I'm taking a moment here to think about that. Well, I'm, I'm also trying to be more aware of the fact that we can talk about grief a lot of times, and because I'm a woman, that's usually what I relate to. But I do want to acknowledge the fact that men do grieve differently, and many men in that grief may turn to something that's really not good or not safe for them or their families. So I kind of want to make sure I reach out to the yeah. male counterpart. 
I'm going to be honest, and look, I may be off base with this question, and I'm always honest about the fact that, like, 90% of my clients are female. So, mm-hmm. I work with many more females who are grieving and rebuilding than men. But, I don't think there's as many differences as people think. I really okay. have to tell you, I think, like, on a grand scale, things are fairly similar. Now, as we take a deeper dive in, are there some differences? Yeah, but... I really think that there's way more similarities than there are differences. I think one of the huge differences is that we live in a society where grief is like taboo in itself. But if right. you come in, let's just be honest, like showing emotion in the society is way more accepted mm-hmm. than as a man. So I do right. think that men have to put on a braver face often, can't show emotion as, as easily, are much like less likely to seek support, whether it's through a group or a conference right. therapist or right. coach. That, to me, is probably the biggest difference that I see. But I think as far as okay. how we all grieve, I think it's very simple. Okay. All right. And certainly, whether it's whether you're male or female, and whether you're a parent or not, at whatever point in your life, for self-care, the self-care concept of being with people that help you, that support you, that just make you feel a little bit better. Those are the people that you can practice self-care with, whether you're a man or a woman. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to tell you, one of the things I found, which I know wasn't your question, but I just have to throw it in there. I think there's like this thought that like if you're a man, you'll have much more support. Like, you know, all the women in the neighborhood will come and they'll make you brownies or they'll make your doorstep. Nobody made me anything. <laughs> I didn't get one thing. I didn't get any cookies. I didn't get any Rice Krispie treats. I didn't get anything. So I just think there's way more that we have in common as far as not only our grief, but how right. the outside world treats us with grief. Yeah, I think that sitcoms in Hollywood that have given us that image yeah. of the women in the neighborhood bringing you brownies and, and dinners and everything. Uh, no one brought me anything either. Right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, I think most of the people that might have done it knew me well enough to know that, A, I probably wouldn't want it, and two, that it might make me feel worse than if they had just kind of left me alone at that moment. Yeah, I wanted some brownies. <laughs> well there you go let it be known that john wants his brownies <laughs> that that was a great point though but, but you're right sometimes we do get those little stereotypical images and they're really not fair they, they really aren't so any other tips you have for people about self-care and practicing self-care yeah i want to say two things so i want to go back to those six words i said earlier really quick happy peaceful, healthy, rejuvenated, productive, and hopeful. I want people to start zoning in on those six words and just pay attention to everything that may, might make them feel any of those things, even if only for a second. Because when we have a profound loss, oftentimes it feels like a part of us don't And we right. don't know who we are anymore. And zoning in on this thing and what makes you feel that is key. The other thing I want to say is this. I want to encourage everyone to remove themselves from the situation. So I think one of the most important versions of self-care is the way that we treat ourselves, the way that we speak to ourselves, and the narrative that we have in our own head about ourselves. And let me give you guys an example. When I start to beat myself up and I start to not give myself credit for things, et cetera, et cetera, I will remove myself from the situation. I will act as though my wife never got sick. She never died. We still have our perfect little life together. And one day I'm out and maybe I'm at the coffee shop and I meet some guy named Joe. And he started a conversation and he asked me for a beer. So I go home and I'm like, hey, Show, you know, I met this guy named Joe. He's new to the neighborhood, and we're going to go get a beer. And she's all happy because she's like, Good, make a new friend, go out for a while, right? <laughs> you know, okay. And I get to the restaurant, and we're having a beer, and he's telling me his life story. That's not his story, 
it's my story about how you know he fell in love with his high school sweetheart and how she broke his heart and how eight years later they reunited under ridiculously difficult circumstances and how he took on the role of being stuck at her kid and all these things and how she got sick and how she got hurt. and everything that he got with that girl he's telling me this story as though it's his story but really it's my story what would I think about this person I would be looking at Joe thinking damn this guy is like a superhero how is he still on his feet we are all so hard on ourselves mm -hmm. we are all so hard on ourselves and we're even harder on ourselves after we go through a full farm mess. Because we feel, for many of us, broken or shattered. And we are mm -hmm. certainly not practicing any versions of self-care. But if we can remove ourselves from our own situation, look at it as though our life was still intact before the horrible thing happened. And somebody else was telling us their story, but it was our life. And we were hearing it, and we think, what would I think about this person? You wouldn't be judging them or thinking they're less than or they're weak. You would be looking at them thinking, damn. Yeah. How are they still on their feet? How are they speaking to me? How do they have a smile on their face? And when you can do that, I think the game begins to change. I like that. I like that very much. It reminds me in some ways of something. I'm sure it was a post somewhere, some social media where someone would come up and say, you know, I, gosh, I don't know how you're doing it. And the response was simple. It was, I wasn't given a choice. So, yeah, so, so many things. John, you have said so many great things in this podcast. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it a couple of times myself because there were so many great comments in there about self-care and things that I never personally thought of myself or ranked as self-care items. So thank you for that. Time has come to wind down, and I always turn the mic over to our guests. You know the routine. You've been here several times before. So now it's your turn. Tell our listeners what you have to offer them. Tell them about your books, please. Yeah, so my website is johnpolocoaching.com. Polo is in Marco Polo, so johnpolocoaching.com. On there, you can find my one-on-one -on -one coaching. You can find my workshops, my groups, my live events. The public speaking is my favorite thing to do. You can follow me on social media for free on all the platforms. I have two podcasts out, and then I have four books. Um, one of the books is about dating as a widowed person. The other one, the latest release, is called The Stupid Shit People Say to Grievers. And then the first two books I wrote are really just raw grief and feeling and emotion with some humor thrown in. Um, and I created all my books for people who have brains like me with ADD and grief brain. So they are the easiest books you will ever read. I agree with everything you just said. I have every one of your books and I love every one of your books. Oh. Every one of your books, uh, there are pages I can turn to and say, yep, that's me. I feel exactly what you've written on the page. And there are other pages that I just think, hmm, I never thought of it in that way before. Every one of those books is fantastic. They really are. Okay, well, now I guess I do have to sign off, but we all know I'll be back again next week. Maybe Stephanie will catch up again sometime, too. She's in and out, but she continues to do the backside and do all the editing and everything. But she's always here, and we always catch up after I've done a recording, and we always talk about the issue and everything. So she's still with us, too. I mentioned I was coming up on the fifth anniversary of my husband's death, and he's still with me in my heart. Um, I still, John, I say this to you every time, I'm still not ready to date. But that being said, I always have my mind open to the fact that it may not be my thought, but who knows, somebody may pop into my life that just um, gives me happiness. So at any rate, for listeners everywhere, everywhere you are, and I know you're scattered around the globe, and I appreciate that so much. Please, please, please consider self-care. And hey, being with other people 
is a real easy way to take care of yourself. So consider that perspective for a little bit because I'm going to consider it even more. I'm surrounded by my family, which gives me huge, huge support and lots and lots of love. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I love watching my grandsons grow up. That's my my form of self-care. And I move through my days laughing, smiling. I'm very, very happy. Yet Tom is in my heart. So self-care, everyone. And tune in again next week as we all continue to live and grieve. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.